The Love Affair event is on at Whole Foods Market with deals on delicious desires through February 14th. The floral department's in full bloom, so look for savings on double dozen bunches of roses. In the meat and seafood departments, save on animal welfare certified New York strip steaks and sustainable wild-caught lobster tails to make the night sizzle. Gifts from the wellness and beauty department are always a nice touch. And you have to grab those chocolate-dipped strawberries. Make Whole Foods Market your Valentine's Day destination. Ruth Langsford joins us on the How To Be 60 podcast this week. She lost her dad to dementia 13 years ago, and for a long time, it was tough. It took me a long time with my dad to accept it, um, because I was younger and I didn't want it to be happening. And Jack was young, you know, and I felt really cheated that Jack didn't know the wonderful granddad that my dad would have been to him, and he was to, to my sister's daughter. And I'm wondering... How to be 60, it's scaring the shit out of me. Welcome and bienvenue and welcome. <laughs> oh God, you're not impressed, are you? <laughs> to another look at Life Beyond the Big Six, though, with me, Kay Adams, and soon to be Granny Mackenzie. Soon to be Granny Mackenzie. I didn't give it enough because you took me by surprise last week so much. I was genuinely taken aback. I didn't see it coming. So, well, I'm just really glad that there's. I can still surprise you, and you can't manage to wheedle everything out of me when I'm not quite ready to reveal. No, well, no, you you, you didn't. You landed it on me, and it hadn't quite sunk in when you said it. But I mean, genuinely, I'm. I'm I am delighted for you. And it's a lovely age to be a granny. It I'll is. be like 107 if I ever get to be a granny. I'll be terrible. Well, my mum was 70 before she was a granny. Well, so was, yeah, my mum was Is that right? Was, oh, no, 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 she wasn't because my brother, of course, he had kids much, much earlier. So it was just with my kids. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, four girls and I'm the youngest and my mother thought it was never going to happen. But um, yeah, it's a good age now that I'm not working. Uh, yeah. It's, 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 Are you excited? So, uh, yeah. Do you know what? Oh, God. And I think this sort of reminds me of Yogi, but you know, that anxiety kicks in because I don't think I've got anxiety. And then I hear you say, oh, God, you know, this is kind of like really sort of, you know, um, worrying me or whatever. And then I think, oh, my God, there is absolutely no reason that Lisa, you know, will miscarry. However, because it's not in my control, mm. there's that anxiety there. And I think that's why. So she was busy telling everybody really early on. And I was like, oh, my God, Lisa, I shoot you. And her reason was, well, you know what? If I miscarry, then people know why I'm upset. I thought, right, that's fine. So it's an interesting take on it. But That, that is a real generational shift, I think, because I didn't even tell my mum I was pregnant until I was 20 weeks. Christ, that's really far on. And it was because I was 38, 39, and I was right. worried about obviously miscarrying. And I thought, well, I don't want to tell anyone. I don't want to tell anyone. But more and more, you do hear younger people saying exactly what Lisa has said. Yeah. That actually they kind of want that to be part of their story and they want it to be. It makes sense. It, it does. But it really made me realize that I come from an older generation. Well, like me, because I didn't tell anyone. I told my family, I told um, my sisters. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of very good friends. And that was it. And it's because it feels like, content, you know, tempting fate. And they're tempting fate. How bizarre is oh, that? It's, it's nuts. mental, it's isn't nuts. it? It's nuts. What are we going to call you? What do you mean? Crabby Granny? <laughs> no, no, Crabby. <laughs> no, like Granny, Granny. Oh, it's got to be Granny. 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 I want to be a Granny as well. Yes, yeah, nice. I do. Yeah, yeah. Granny. People go through all sorts, like Glamma. And I do, no. I, I do know someone who goes for Nonna. Nonna? Aye. That's like, yeah, it's like, oh, no. how's your nonna? No, it's not. It is. That's no, not as right not. name. I've never heard it is. called that in It's like when people don't want to call the real names. Not nonna. It's sort of a nonna, for God's sake. <laughs> it's, it's Italian for how's grandmother. Your nonna? Oh, is it? Ah, and it's no language for Fanny, I can tell you. <laughs> well, it sounds it. You don't use that in Scotland <laughs> unless your partner's called Okay, we're going for granny, granny or something. We're going for granny. But yes. I'll tell you what, we're going to have to wipe this podcast when this baby goes to school. Because, because do you think we'll still be going? No, no, but we're going to have to wipe them. We're going to oh, have to I see. No trace of them because we don't want the baby hearing about, you know, you and your vibrator habit and your sex holidays to Puglia <laughs> and all of your kind well, of... Yeah, all these made up stories that are just come no, right out it, of my... it, Don't you do that to me. <laughs> I was never the one who started talking about vibrators on this podcast. Oh my God, Kate, I think it, it was you. you. I, I, 
I've got the evidence. I have got the evidence. You were the one who started it. It was episode three, and it's never gone away since. Oh my and God. you're the one who goes on sex holidays Stop. with Maggie. To <laughs> oh my Julia. God. You do. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want that baby to, to grow up with that. It's funny, actually, you know, that the kind of older thing, I mean, obviously you do things in your past. So the this woman tour that I know you've got no interest in at all, and that's fine. I've accepted it. No, I just it. forgot to come. That was yeah. all. Got to, but if you told me that Jane Moore was going to be there, I would have been along. Anyway, sorry, 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 sorry. Anyway, so we were there in Ipswich, and don't ask why, but we were talking about alfresco sex. Oh, who brought that up? See, look, look at you. Look at I'm you intrigued got... because I want to know what your take on it is. You've got a wee glow there. I have okay, because I'm interested in what your take is. No, oh, I'm good to tell you what the, the people in the audience. So there's obviously older people in the audience, and Linda Robson was out in the audience going, have you had alfresco sex? Oh, sticking a microphone under people's noses. Well, actually, first of all, it's put your hands up. And, of course, you're looking at this audience of a 1,000 people and, you know, <laughs> ages from late 20s, but most of them, I would say, 40 up. And a sea of hands oh goes up. Oh, my God, is that right? And I'm looking and I'm just envisaging all these older women shagging outside. But obviously... Well, I'm thinking they're remembering when they were young. Maybe they are. And like, so Linda's gone out and speaking to them and said, yes, yes, I, I had um, alfresco sex in the doorway of a Burger King. Oh, uh, yes, I had romantic. alfresco sex on a tractor. On a tractor. On a tractor. Which is the engine on? It's a very good effort. Yeah. Oh my God, the vibration of the tractor, you can just sort of, that's probably quite you know, um, enhances it. Would you not think? <laughs> Tractors are hardly, you know, your Lamborghini engine, are they? It's got to be like, drrr, you know, anyway. Your mind works in the strangest of ways. Tractor. Yeah. Yeah. So the engine would enhance it. <laughs> if it was switched on, it would. That's Ruth Langsford. She's embarrassed by you, I can tell. So listen, <laughs> did the panel have to comment on whether they'd had alfresco sex? Oh, no, I never. I just smile and sort of pass on, you know what it's like. And what um, they'd asked you? Um, would I'd, you have lied? No, no, I never lie. I'm very honest. You're a blind witch <laughs> at the best of times. What would you have said, Kate? Um... Look at me. I don't want to look at you. <laughs> You're looking at your script with just got nothing like this on it. Anyway, let's look move on. What? Hey. Right. <laughs> How old were you and where when you had alfresco sex? This is not what, listen, Ruth Langsford doesn't like this kind of thing. She is she desperate to get in. She and if she's got any sex, she'll pick up on it right away as she soon won't. as she comes on. She won't because she's like me. She's well brung up. She's well brung up. She really is. Was it in Greenshire? Shut up. No, no, it was Florida, actually. Um, so <laughs> Nice warm sands. <laughs> oh, actually, I'm feeling really creeped out. Stop it. Anyway, yeah, so we've got Ruth with us today. Yeah. Yes, um, and uh, yeah, my colleague on this woman as well, and uh, I think you might get on actually because she's got a bit of a camper vibe going on. <laughs> I uh, saw the like photo. You. <laughs> Do you see that lovely oh, photograph? It's so beautiful! It's so sweet. I know it was lovely. Taken back in 1965, and there's wee baby Ruth in the back of a converted <laughs> Bedford van. <laughs> Doing the washing up like a good girl. Um, and Dad lying on a sun lounge. That's like the right way to tea and a big it's... smile. It was lovely. So I thought, it was gorgeous. There you go. I said, Ruth and Karen might get on. The only thing you won't get on is Ruth turned into a bit of fashionista and mm. she's got her own fashion line now. We just use that bloody jumper. She's going oh, to tell you. All oh, right. Come but on. you know what? Kate, Look at it. Kate, the jumper is fine. I'm going to. It's industrial. It's lovely. It's sure, your boob. She doesn't want to see that. But the jumper, anyway, I'm afraid this jumper that we've turned, autumn has come in. Ruth got and a swatch of your pendulous breasts there, Eric, didn't she? We're not talking about them anymore. <laughs> And I think this is the jumper on now for the rest of the, for the next six months. <laughs> um, right. A couple of things. The excitement in your house is you're going to be a granny. The excitement in this mm -hmm. house is that finally tomorrow, and I'm very mm -hmm. excited about it, um, that I am going to get to open the gift that you gave to me, which has got labelled on it very oh, strongly. <laughs> do not eat. Do, do not eat by. Do not eat before. Do not eat before. Never have I seen a label that says do not eat before the 19th of September. Yeah, it's got to mature. And we are recording like yourself. this <laughs> on the 18th of September. Your homemade sweet Cucumber, cucumber pickle. pickle. I'll be making a lot more of that before the, yes. the month's out. So very exciting. Tomorrow what I'll have it with. I, I'm going to get some cheese and I'm going to nice. open it Bit in the key. presence of Anton Dubeck, who we're interviewing next week. 
Because, I mean, he's used to big occasions, and I think the opening of your sweet cucumber pickle is really, really going to do it for him. going to really take the piss out of me, because you know what? <laughs> if that if that's the case, then that's the last of the gifts I'm going to give you. Oh, they, oh, don't tell me it's the last jar of sweet cucumber pickle you'll give me. I'll just absolutely <laughs> die if that is the case. <laughs> but on a slightly more serious note, mm-hmm. before we speak to Ruth and do our email of the week, um, this was a genuinely fascinating um, interview well, I say an interview I did, I don't mean that. This a genuinely fascinating young man that I interviewed on the radio the other week. He really made me think. So he's 22, he's a, a Dutch nursing student, mm-hmm. and he has lived in a nursing home for um, elderly people for three years, like genuinely lived there as a resident. He calls them his housemates, and he's written a book about it. Um, and he wanted to do this. I think he comes from a nursing background, like his parents and stuff, but he wanted to do this because he thought, right, okay, one day in the future, I might have dementia. And I want to, and he's a nurse, and he wants to understand. Oh my God, experience the whole the the life that you know the the way that we're caring for people. Right. And his conclusions were that we're overly controlling of people with dementia. We treat them as sufferers. There's too much of an emphasis on the quantity of life of how long you can keep them alive, how long you can keep them safe, if you like, mm. as opposed to a quality of life and actually, you know, engaging with people and kind of accepting the fact they have dementia, but not letting that absolutely define them. And, you know, he's made real friendships and relationships with older people with dementia in Mm -hmm. in this home. And he points out stuff like, you know, the institutionalized nature of it, Mm -hmm. you know, like, plastic plants rather than real plants because they're just kind of easier to keep Aww. um no pets they have oh, a really? they have no a robotic pets. pet mm-hmm. and i'm not saying that i absolutely agree with him because i thought well maybe he's just been naive maybe he's just young and obviously there's health and safety concerns and you know there's reasons that they have to lock the door and uh, you know maybe not allow them to have pets but i thought he did throw up a really interesting insight into the way that we do sort of medicalize people mm-hmm. who God. are older and okay they have developed dementia but doesn't mean that they don't want to have life so it's interesting yeah anyway <laughs> there we go shall we have our email of the week yes wendy and yes. then we will speak to ruth so this is from wendy and Wendy is after some advice, she says. From us? Yes, well, you've come to the wrong place then, Wendy. Yes. Um, she says, I am planning a three-month break to Europe. Oh, excellent. But it may mean leaving my job and finding another one on my return. Go for it. I'll ask, can you wait till the end of no, the question? No, no, I'm happy to intervene at the end of each breath. I'll ask about unpaid leave, but I'm not convinced my employer will grant me that. Mm -hmm. I started work at 16. I've worked all my life, full and part-time, brought up my son, achieved uh, an open university degree last year. I'm now approaching 60. Would you risk it? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Where should I finish it? I am debt-free, by the way. My husband's retired and she loves the show. Oh, my God. What's not to... Yeah, absolutely go for it. But well... Oh, my God, yes. I gave up work for three months once went around the world and I never ever regretted it and it was like a whistle stop tour of the places I'd like to have gone back to see some of them I have gone back to and yes I was very lucky that they kept my job open but now I think you'll have no problem getting your job back do you not think yeah well no probably not actually so do you know what live life and go for it oh my god absolutely go for it is there a is there a partner yeah he's retired I wonder Uh, if he's going to go with her yeah I think I agree with you Wendy we're you saying go for it. it. But you know what? I would, I'm going to say go for it, but I wouldn't do it. Oh, no, you wouldn't. And we've talked about this before because you don't want to leave the children. Oh, my God. The kids are probably saying, Mum, we'll pay for the train fare to get you down to London to get you out of the country. <laughs> Dot com. That's what it is. We're very professional, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll speak to Ruth after this. The Love Affair event is on at Whole Foods Market with deals on delicious desires through February 14th. The floral department's in full bloom. So look for savings on double dozen bunches of roses. In the meat and seafood departments, save on animal welfare certified New York strip steaks and sustainable wild caught lobster tails to make the night sizzle. Gifts from the wellness and beauty department are always a nice touch. And you have to grab those chocolate dipped strawberries. Make Whole Foods Market your Valentine's Day destination. 
Hi, Ruth. Hi. How are you two? How are you? I'm good, thank you. I'd say, when do you do it? But I'm like UK. I'd say do it, but I probably wouldn't. <laughs> but but the, it's that, well, why wouldn't you do it? I don't know. I've never been spontaneous like that. I wish I was. I wish I was more spontaneous and a bit more carefree and not worry, but I would worry about, oh, will I have a job when I come back? You know, there's people that say that they're going away and they haven't booked anywhere to stay. Lives should give me hives. I go, what do you mean you haven't got anywhere to stay? They go, oh, we'll just find somewhere when we get there. I, I have to know where I'm going, where I'm staying, what time we're arriving. So I don't know what that says about me, but yeah, I'm not, I, I'm I'm quite cautious. Yeah. I see the same thing about you, Raymond. I was trying to get him to move to Northern Ireland. <laughs> He did worry about what you might see, Ruth. The thing is, I've always known that he wants to be in Northern Ireland and I think we'll have to find a compromise, you know. So we're at that stage in our lives, which we never thought we'd be at. You know, when we were first together, we talk, you know, you talk about things like that as if it's so far away. And you, and then suddenly you're facing the day. I go, oh, my God, we're in our 60s. And so I think probably we'll end up with somewhere here and there. So we, you know, probably have a smaller house here and have something there. Because I love Northern Ireland, but it's a different feeling for me because Eamon has all his family there. You know, all his brothers, two of his children, his granddaughter. So, you know, I've got my family here. My mum's still alive. So it's, you know, when you get older, you have to think about your parents as well if they're still alive, don't you? And um, so it's, uh, but I know that's where he wants to be eventually because he's a Belfast boy. The thing is, I don't come from anywhere. Or I say, when people say, where do you come from? I say, I don't know. Because my father was in the army. I was born abroad, born in Singapore, travelled around with them, went to boarding school. You know, so I was at Cornwall for a little while when my parents had retired there and then came back to London. So I don't have that draw of somewhere that I go, that's home. You know, I I just don't, never have. I would like to travel and do more and see more. But as a tourist, I, I don't feel like I want to you know, take two years off and go backpacking around, you know, Southeast Asia. That, mm-hmm. that wouldn't be for me. And I did a lot of camping as a kid. So I'm kind of, you know, five star all the way now, if I can. <laughs> <laughs> but when are you going to do all this, Ruth? I don't know, because I still love working and I'm working a lot and I love it. So, but, you know, I'm grateful for that because, you know, Kay, particularly in our industry, I mean, it's it's different now, a little bit, little bit better now, thank God for loose women. But, if you'd have said to me when I was 35, 40, do you still think you'll be working in TV at 63? I'd have laughed in the face and said, absolutely no. We'll be, you know, we'll be put out to grass when we were 40, probably. Um, so I didn't ever think I would still be working as working as much. I'm working more now, probably, than I ever have when I, since I've been freelance. Um, and I love it. I love what I do. So I just carry on doing that and I'm not really making any plans. I've never been a great you know, where do you see yourself in five years? You know, when you do those, people ask mm. you those in interviews. And I was like, I really don't know. I don't think about it that far ahead. Mm. So you don't mm. have a sort of, you haven't plotted a path? No, not at all. And then sometimes I hear people that have plotted a path. Um, I think it was Jenny Eclair, wasn't it, on, on this podcast I listened to, where she said, she, you know, has she put away enough money? But then I find all that a little bit morbid, If I started now going, right, so I'm 63, I might live till I'm 85, (laughs) you know, how much money will I need? So I find it a bit depressing and a bit scary. Having said that, I've seen it with both my parents. We're talking about that that young man you were just discussing. Um, With dementia, my father had Alzheimer's. My mum is now 91 and living in assisted living, not allowed to call it a care home. It's assisted Hmm. living. Um, I know, and I've seen their money being spent on that, which is fantastic that they had the money to spend on that. That's because they worked very hard and they saved a lot. I'm not a great saver, I never have been really. So it does bring it into sharp focus when you suddenly see family members and go, oh gosh, that will be me in the not too distant future, probably in some way. You know, I mean, old age is a wonderful thing if you have your health. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, and so you see elderly people who are fit as fleas and independent and sound of mind. That's wonderful. But a lot of people don't have that. And that's the scary side and the side that I have seen with both parents. So that Mm. does worry me. So I'm taking a lot more notice now of my pension (laughs) investments. And for the last few years, I've been putting more into those, putting more away and being more sensible. Because, you know, when you were young... 
When people mention pensions, you know, just just roll your eyes. I remember my dad going, now you've got to make sure you've got a pension. This is when we were all staff, you know, I was staff and we had pensions anyway. And you just used to roll your eyes and go, yeah, yeah, dad, yeah, fine. And make sure you save a bit. Yeah, yeah, dad. And you never thought that day would come when you would look at your savings and think, have I got enough? Or look at your pension and think, have I got enough? And when you see, you know, having help to look after both parents you kind of think gosh that's quite a responsibility for kids do I want Jack to have that responsibility of looking after me um yeah so it's it it just means as you get older you just think about it a bit more which you never ever thought I would hear myself say but here I am saying it 63. Yeah I mean I've said to you I'm gonna downsize I'm gonna funny I haven't even mentioned this to Ian right enough um (laughs) And and I do think about, okay, do I need to leave them something? What I mean, I'm lucky enough that my mum and dad left both my kids uh, an amount of money, so that's been really good. But I do go through the calculations in my head because, like you, Ruth, my mum and dad were, were um, you know, needed care for quite a long time, and it burns money. It burns a phenomenal amount of money, and you would have to be seriously wealthy uh, far beyond anything mm-hmm. I've got to to sustain that for a long period of time, and but the thing is, if you my don't kids have are young, it, I mean, Bonnie's only sixteen. If you don't have that money, and you're in a care home, well, I guess the state will pay for you, but then you take what you'll you'll get, you know. Well, it, yeah, it was interesting that the the young man you were talking about, Kay, who you interviewed, you know, that he lived in a care home, and his his um, views and conclusions are very interesting and enlightening, and to a degree, I agree with a lot of it. However, there is a safety issue that, you know, um, and as much as you want, you, I believe that people with dementia, Alzheimer's, whatever it is they have, have to be allowed their dignity and their pride. You also have to take care of them because the fact is they've got dementia. They forget to turn the cooker off. They forget things. So, you know, I think it very much depends on the care home you're in. Mm. Um, Some of them are, I would say most of them probably are fantastic. Some aren't. And I know when my sister and I were looking for a care home for my dad, because we were moving them up here, so we went looking and kind of honed it down to two or three and then brought my mum up and said, have a look. I was shocked by some of the attitudes, not necessarily the place, but I remember one care home, my sister asked about their, what kind of um, entertainments and things they had for the residents. And the woman said, sorry, entertainment. My sister went, well, yes, you know, do you do, do you have any activities, flower arranging or gardening club or something? And she went, oh, no, dear. she went, most of them are away with the fairies. She actually said that to us, family, you know, we were looking for somewhere for my dad. She went, no, most of them away with the fairies, they wouldn't know. And that's the attitude that's wrong. It's that attitude. Um, but I think the hardest thing is for, and I've always said this, it's not always the person with dementia, it's the family. Because my dad was, seemed to be fairly happy with dementia. You know what I mean? He, he was quite healthy right up until the end. He was always smiling. He liked music still. Um, I think he started to forget who we were a little bit, but he liked seeing us because we always brought him cake or biscuits. And But it's when people don't have a quality of life. And so it's hard for the family. So all you can do for that person is, you know, if they are in a care home, is to visit regularly if you can, check on them, check on their happiness. You know, I've, I've learned so much with my father having Alzheimer's when we knew nothing about it. And I used to think I was helping by trying to make him remember things, which is absolutely the worst thing you can do. And I think I was in a bit in denial, actually. I didn't want him to have Alzheimer's. I was really upset. I was losing him. So all the time I'd go, oh, yeah, remember, Dad, remember, Dad. Dad, you remember, don't you? Daddy, remember, don't you? Remember when we went here? Daddy, remember, don't you? Dad, remember, 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 remember. And of course, he didn't remember. And then he would get very frustrated. So I've learnt now with people with dementia is like the worst thing you can do to them is say do you remember you remember this don't you and you just have to go with each moment you know when when I'm with my mom she's in the moment she understands she enjoys the moment she might not remember it tomorrow probably doesn't remember it tomorrow and that doesn't really matter actually it took me a long time with my dad to accept it 
um, because I was younger and I didn't want it to be happening. And Jack was young, you know, and I felt really cheated that Jack didn't know the wonderful granddad that my dad would have been to him. And he was to, to my sister's daughter. So that, you know, I felt cheated by that. But then I think well, I was very lucky to have all that time with him. And he wasn't in pain. You know, he still had a nice life. It was a different life, but he still had a nice life. He must have been quite young, was he? When he, he Well, he was diagnosed in his early 70s. It took us about two years of, of us saying something's not right here. And even now, occasionally, my mum and I would be talking about something and she'll wait. Hey, do you remember dad was a bit funny? Daddy was a bit funny that day, wasn't he? And we look back and think that probably when he was about 65, mm. that's a worry because I'm going 63, you know, now certain behaviours that we just went, Dad, what are you doing? Or thinking he was just being a bit difficult or a bit cantankerous, I now think actually was the start of mm. his dementia. We just didn't know. And actually, even now, statistics are quite high of even GPs of a recent survey said that one in three GPs don't actually know how to diagnose Alzheimer's you know they miss things mm. um so yeah so I think in his you know kind of mid to late 60s actually and does that worry you yeah always um but I try not to let it consume me you know so whenever they have these um you know oh you can do a test to tell to say if you would be prone to getting Alzheimer's I don't really want to do it because there's no cure at the moment. So if I could do that test and then they said, right, now you know this is what you do to stop you getting it. We take this tablet, you have to do these exercises, you have to eat this or don't eat that. But there's nobody can tell you that. So I almost don't want to know. I don't want to know. But of course, you know, every time I go, where are my glasses are on my head or where are my keys? And I do have those little moments. And I have those, you know, the blank moments where you suddenly forget someone's name somebody you know really well and it's gone and you think oh my god so of course I worry with you know both parents um but I try not to um think about it too much because it's too depressing mm. do you do it well I'm, I'm gonna make you be a bit more depressing for a bit <laughs> yeah cheers Kate no, no sorry well it's just because we're kind of in the same boat in that you know having had children later you know, do, does it worry you that, that Jack might have to sort of deal with things at an earlier age than we had to deal with? I mean, like my mum and dad, yeah. when it went south for them, mm -hmm. I was 50, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, I felt, well, okay, this is it, you know, it's time for me to step up. But I don't know if, what, if I want my kids, and I won't have the choice, obviously, but I don't know if I want them doing it when they're 25. Yeah. No, and yeah, I do think about that, and you know, and also like, oh, well, congratulations, Karen, going to be a granny. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, but like you said, Kate, you know, I do think, oh, I wonder if I'll see Jack have children, you know, because I didn't have him till I was forty-two, and you know, they don't always get married as young now or start families as young. So I do, again, I try not to think too much about it because then it's a bit morbid and depressing. But of course, it crosses my mind, and actually, that's probably why. I am financially trying to make sure that I am secure so that all he'll have to deal with is going, you know, choose the care home, but it's all funded and it's fine and you won't have to be looking after me because I wouldn't want that for him at such a young age. And No, but there's the other thing. I'm sorry, I'm going for it here. Ruth. God, um, we really are, aren't we? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll brighten up. But you get to a stage of parents, and my mum and dad would have said at a certain time as well, oh, throw me in a care home, yeah. chuck you know don't come and see me don't you get on with your life and you know they mean that and I I will probably say that to my kids yeah but when it actually happens of course that's normal because you love them and I mean it sounds as if you had you know a fabulous family unit fantastic and actually you're right my dad because my grand my grandmother on my father's side it was never officially diagnosed but she had some kind of dementia older. you know when her, when my grandfather died they were so close I think she kind of died of a broken heart actually and she went very mentally unstable and whatever it was um she ended up in a care home and my dad would come home often from visiting her and say exactly that Jesus you know if ever this happens to me just put me away don't you be dragging yourselves in and then he used to say you know just get the, the bloody shotgun and shoot me and it became a family joke so if ever my dad forgot something or he did something weird I'd go mum get the shotgun 
Jazz on one, get the shotgun, and it became ha, ha, ha. But, of course, when that person develops dementia, they don't know that that's happening to them. So, you, of course, you don't then say, oh, right, now it's time. And actually, the hardest thing, um, and, you know, so many people, I'm sure, listening will know that who've had to do it, is deciding that somebody needs to go in a care home. is like, it's just horrific. And, you know, it was my sister and I that had to eventually persuade my mum that it was time because we were concerned about her and she didn't have dementia and she was fit and well but she was making herself ill looking after my father so are you going to work till you drop then Ruth I don't think I'll work till I drop but while I'm capable of working and enjoy well more important not capable while I'm enjoying working and I really do I love what I do and I have done for years and years and years which makes it much easier, doesn't it? I mean, I think if I hated my job, I would definitely be looking to retire if I was able to financially retire. But um, I enjoy what I do, so I'm not looking to retire. Mm-hmm. And how about the prospect of just you and Eamon when Jack's like flown the nest completely? That side of it doesn't really worry me. The empty nest. I mean, I had empty nest for a week when Jack went, as in really properly crying every time I walked past his room going, oh! missed him just missed his smell missed him being around but that went because I think I've got a busy life you know I think I didn't have time to dwell on it but you know I love seeing him fly I like seeing him have his life now that's what you know that's what we wanted didn't we we want happy balanced children that are going off into the big wide world and I am excited for his adventures to come and you know I always remember my mum saying to me oh you never stop worrying about your children you know when you're young you think but it's so true. And, you know, lots of things my mum said to me resonate now, you know, when you've got kids and you start saying, oh, yeah, my mum used to say that to me all the time. Shouted at him about leaving lights on and then thought, oh, my God, I've turned into my father. He used to do that. Oh, used to- God, yeah. So um, just a bit of fashion advice for Karen before we finish. <laughs> I thought your jumper was very fetching. It's very in. The striped look is very off the season, can I say, Karen? Thank you very much. Indeed. Stripes are key. Thinking, yeah, take something. some tips. Yeah, I know. Modern. Yeah. So, how much are you loving the fashion side? Because you're you're doing a lot of that now, aren't you? I love it. I absolutely love it. Not that I consider myself to be any kind of fashionista, but this came about completely out of the blue, which has been wonderful because I didn't go looking for it. And I think sometimes things come into your life, you know, you have that moment where you it's unexpected and you make that decision. Do I say, oh, wow, yes, I'm very interested, thank you. Or do you go, oh, I don't know, don't think that's quite for me. It's like a sliding doors moment. Um, and so QVC got in touch with my agent, asked for a meeting <clears throat> and said, we'd like to talk to you about doing um, a clothing range with us, under your name, with us. And I was like, wow, I would love to do that. So I've just been able to to kind of design clothes basically for myself. So when people say, what's your inspiration? I go, I'm designing for myself. I really am. And actually, my age is very much a positive thing, not a negative. It's completely a positive thing because their customers are for the clothes are not young. I mean, they're not looking for younger. They, They want my age group. And those women are responding to me because I'm the same age as a lot of them. Um, you know, so I feel there, it's not, I don't kind of think, oh, you know, another couple of years and I'll be too old for this. I don't mm. at all. And so long may it continue. If you seem so unflappable, is there anything that makes you flap? Has anything made you yeah, flap? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, there will be things that make me flap. But I think that, um, I think I've always been quite sensible. I'm not, you know, I'm not too, um, I'm not very dramatic. I'm quite I'm quite sensible. I think a lot of that comes from my parents, maybe army life. And also I went to boarding school, so maybe that made us mature a little bit. I had to do my own washing, make my own bed, travel. My sister and I travelled at a very young age. You know, we were unaccompanied minors. And then eventually, whenever my sister was whatever age, we travelled together. So, you know, things with Jack, maybe if ever he was ill, things like that, that you worry about your family would make me... But not flap. Again, I'm quite... What needs doing here? Just mean what needs doing? Yeah, what needs doing? Come on then. I might flap afterwards. I might be frightened afterwards and go, oh my God, I can't believe that just happened. But, you know, it's like when Eamon fell down the stairs. 
it was, you know, it was in the middle of the night and it was very scary, but there's no point me flapping going, oh my God. It was just like, okay, you're okay. Right. Stay there. Let me get a blanket. Let me get a cushion. Let me phone an ambulance. Let me sit with you, you know, just to try and keep you calm and get me get some water. So I'm calm like that. You, you mentioned your sister a few times. Were you peas in a pod or different? Very different. Very close. Very, very different. I mean, my sister was very um, quiet. She was the nicest one. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was the nicest of the two. Now, she was a very good big sister. You know, she really looked out for me at boarding school. And I was slightly naughty. I'm not saying that's a virtue, but my sister was very, very good. She was never in trouble at school, never in trouble at home. She didn't really do anything naughty. And because of her, I always used to say to her, I wasn't that naughty, actually, but you were so bloody good. You made me look like I was really naughty. And I wasn't. Um so, yeah, so all through school, she was two and a half years older than me. All through school, it was like, you know, why can't you? Your sister was never like this. Oh, God. Um, yeah, so she was, um, and she always used to, when we were at boarding school, she would come down, you had to, letter writing was on a Thursday or something. And she would come down, I'd be like joshing around in the common room with all my mates and she'd knock on the door and they'd go, oh, your sister's here. I'd go, oh. She'd go, have you written to mum and dad? No, right, sit down and she'd have the airmail letter, have the pen, she'd have the stamp on it, she'd make me, she'd literally sit and make me write my letter and then she'd go, right, and she'd post it. And my mum, um, my mum, when she was moving from Cornwall up to here, she gave us our letters that they'd kept and my sister's pile was huge because she used to write, you know, every week and she'd write like six pages front and back and it was all very detailed and mine was like the tiniest pile. (laughs) compared to hers because I mine was just scrawled because she'd made me hi mum and dad hope you're well I'm fine please can you send five pounds and some marmite see you Easter love Ruth (laughs) that's all I wanted was can you send me some money or can send me some chocolate spread so yeah so she was the good you know she was the good girl and very organized yeah Mm -hmm. are you at the stage now that you can pull up these really good memories because obviously very difficult to I am I am You know, I do a lot of crying and I do it in the shower mostly. And actually, I think for me, work, you know, Eamon was amazing during that time. Amazing. And Jack. Um, And then work, to me, it was like you need, I needed a focus, which was get up. Right, and I would cry in the shower, have a big old ball. And then I could almost cut it off and go, right, come on, time for work. You know, dry your hair go to work and I needed that because I could lie and cry all day about my sister I needed that focus you know some people can't cope with that I needed that structure back in my life and there are things you know it's the same with my dad that certain times things hit you like certain piece of music like my dad loved jazz so if I hear Ella Fitzgerald because he used to play it on the piano a lot for my mum that gets me even to now you know I'm just like oh or um you know, Father's Day recently, and I see the cards, and you kind of reach to go and get something, don't you? Or Christmas, reaching for a card. I always used to get my sister funny. She liked funny cards. Um, and then I think, you know, and then it's, it jolts you, doesn't it, where you think, oh, I don't need to get her a card anymore. So I think everybody has their pain. You know, we all end up losing people we love. And you. Um, I think it's important, though, that you don't lock it all away in a box. Yeah. And Very much. It's... You know, I mean, having done so many of these podcasts now, and obviously everyone we speak to is of a similar age, and as you say, we've all got our pain, Ruth. You just don't get to this age w- w- without no. it. And actually, the people that I've spoken to that I feel most pain for are those who've not had that family love. Mm. And, I mean, much as I miss my mom and dad, you know, so much, um, you know, I-, I had a wonderful relationship with them. You know, I couldn't have wished for better parents. Yeah. And I've spoken to some, or, you know, my brother, we've, we've had a happy family. And we've spoken to people, haven't we, who who haven't had that. Yes. And that is a real, you know, to have had people in their lives that actually that they're not getting that family love. And we've had it. Yes. Yeah. Well, I would say that because Eamon was, you know, when I first met Eamon, he was, he couldn't get his head round that my sister and I had gone to, you know, I was, I was seven, just turning eight when I went to boarding school. And he just found that whole thing. just And he used to say things like, oh my God, your parents sent you away when you were seven. I was like, well, they didn't send me away. 
because to us it was just a it was just a way of life like loads of army kids and navy kids and RAF kids went to boarding school so I said to him when we went to the airport it wasn't just me and my sister standing there it was like hundreds of army air force naval kids all going back to you know boarding school in the UK it's just what we did and I'm sure many of them still do it um, yeah. yeah. So we didn't know anything different. And I said to him, and I would go months without seeing my parents because with the army paid for flights just three times a year. So it would be kind of Easter, summer, Christmas, half terms. We went to my granny's house. She had a little tiny council flat in Portsmouth, my mum's mum. And we used to go there. So I would go from, you know, going back after the summer, I wouldn't see my parents till Christmas. And yet I was really close to my parents. So mm. I never felt unloved. I never felt like I'd been sent away. We didn't have mobile phones. We didn't call. It was letters, like me, not Mm -hmm. writing very often, but my parents would write letters. And when we went home, it was like I hadn't been away. You know, they'd pick us up from the airport and everyone was excited and we'd have our... My sister was terribly homesick um, and she probably should never have gone to boarding school, really. Um, But, you know, they did that because they thought it was a better education so you weren't moving around. But I loved boarding school. I was like, see ya. I'd go off, like, hardly waving you know, behind, because I loved it. It was a great adventure. It was fun. Um, But, you know, just because, you know, just because you're with somebody, I always say to Eamon, it's not about the time, it's the quality of the time, isn't it? I never felt unloved. And yet there'll be children who are with their parents all the time in the same house who feel very unloved. So I was very lucky in my opinion. And we're a very small family. My parents are both only children. So we had no real aunts and uncles, no cousins. Um, So, you know, we were a very tight tiny family and my and my parents only had my sister and I so you know we were very close and what about could you ever have thought of sending Jack never never <laughs> I remember tucking Jack up in bed and he was when he was seven or something so we'd done the thing and just had a chat and a story whatever and I do remember thinking oh my god this is the age I was when I went to boarding school and the thought of yes. him like not being here and being at boarding school, I was like, no, I couldn't do it. But I never, ever thought that about my parents. I absolutely understood totally why they sent us to boarding school, like so many others, you know, all the kids yeah. I was at boarding school with. We were all we were all there yeah. because our it parents your, thought it was better. Yeah, it was your normal. It wouldn't have been completely different. our normal. Yeah. Um, Listen, let's have a quick game of Big Six or Bingo. Yes. We're taking a lot of your time. What Bingo? What's this? So we've got 60 questions. Choose two numbers and the lovely Karen will give you two. That's me. Um, yeah, so two numbers between one and 60. Eight. Eight. Right, hold on. Hardest year of your life, Ruth. Oh, gosh. Well, when my sister died, I can't even tell you what year it is because I've just said I've kind of blocked it from my memory, really. But, yeah, that, just mm-hmm. that. Okay, another number, please. Uh, let's go 60 then, as we're how to be 60. Ooh. Um, guilty secret to eat. Ooh. Pot noodle. Oh, pot. Christ. Oh, I my. love a pot noodle. <laughs> you like you plummeted in my estimation. I know, but I see who'd have thought, because I love cooking, I love good food, but I do really like a pot noodle. Chicken I'm and mushroom. I've never tasted one, but oh, geez. God, they're lovely. And they did um, they did a Christmas dinner pot noodle one. Oh, God. <laughs> delicious. Turkey it's delicious. Yeah. Turkey and all the trimmings. <laughs> Good. Oh, Ruth, it's been lovely to t- speak to you because I never get the chance to bloody speak to you. I because- know, because we always like opposite shifts, aren't we? All right. Well, listen, thanks so much. Yeah, thank thank you. You. Nice to meet you, Karen. And, yeah, and, you. and say hi to Eamon there. I, I will do. Yeah. Do it for right. me as well and see, for God's sake, get your backside over to Northern Ireland sooner or later. <laughs> I know, we will. As it happens, we have Ruth Strictly Dance Partner with us next week, the lovely Mr. Anton de Beg. He's only 57, but we thought we'd give him special dispensation. Keep those emails coming. We'd love to know how the Big 6 is going for you. No time to relax. Subscribe to the Hypno SOS podcast. It's calming, effective, and best of all, it's short, around 10 minutes, so you can always find time to listen. So, if you need help with sleep, reducing anxiety, or letting go of stress, or you just need a boost, Hypno SOS is for you. 
Written and presented by a therapist with over 30 years experience, Ursula James. That's me, by the way. Its weekly episodes contain deep relaxation and powerful and highly effective suggestions to help you get control in your life. With around 200 episodes to choose from and new ones each week, you'll definitely find something that will appeal to you. It's not hypnosis. It's Hypno SOS. And in case you just zoned out there, I'll spell it for you. H-Y-P-N-O-S-O-S. Available on all the usual platforms. Go on, give it a try. 